right. What's good, y'all? Welcome back to the Onyx Report. Black Masculine's news for the day. Yeah, man. Just uh, wanted to hit up a part two uh, real quick. Wait a minute. Hold on one second here. One moment. All right. All right. Welcome back to the Onyx Report, people. Black Masculine's news for the day. I hope everybody is well. Shout out to African Repat. Charles, what's going on? Growth Talk with Kofa. Y'all make sure you support the Growth Talk with, with Kofa channel. Good to see you in here, man. Yeah, man, I had to go uh, I had to go spook for the thumbnail, man. It's one of my favorite movies. I've actually been teaching off that movie since ooh, 1993. So um, I was talking to BGS about doing a Patreon review of it, but, you know, um, I wasn't sure how many brothers would show out for that. So if y'all are interested in a, por a Patreon review of the Spook Who Sat By The Door, hey man, let me know. You know what I'm saying? And we can do it. Um, shout out to Corey. Shout out to Urban Naturalist. Hope you're well. What's up, Clutch? Yeah, man. Cold Dan Freeman. Real talk. Shout out to Barry. Uh, dropping info on the channel. I uh, appreciate the support, man. Thank you very much. Uh, shout out to Prince. Shout out to Mark. Um, goodness. Like, share, subscribe, join, and donate. Support the channel. Shout out to David for the Cash App. Generous Cash App of $100. Much appreciated. Um, thank you for that. Shout out to Black Power for the Cash App. Shout out to Barry Little. Um, he says, uh, Saturday evening tuition drop and rest in peace to Brother Louis Gossett Jr. Real talk. About to get into him uh, in a little bit. Just watched uh, Officer and a Gentleman with my son last night in, uh, in acknowledgement. He wasn't familiar with who Lou Gossett was. So, yeah. Um, but as an 80s kid, I was just as familiar with some of his less uh, lesser known films like Iron Eagle, e Eagle. I don't know if I'd say it's lesser known, but it wasn't taken as seriously. But I still loved it anyway, even though uh, Lou was, you know, he tended to do movies where he was known more doing movies with white folk. He still did a lot of them. One of my favorites is his role in Lackawanna Blues. If you're not familiar, that's an incredible flick. Go check Lou Gossett out in that. And the man has been active I and mean, he was just in the latest Color Purple. So he stayed active despite a uh, few things we'll talk about in a moment. Anyway, shout out to uh, Supreme. What's up, Spain man? What's going on? A snowman in the building. What's up, Andre? Tavares. Got Paul in here. Says, uh, had to be there for this one. Wrote a detailed analysis of Spook who sat by the door for a paper I wrote for a college class. Yeah, I hear you. I'm not, this this particular um, show is not about Spook, but um, like I said, if you guys want me to cover Spook, we can definitely do that. And with the Patreon, y'all can join in and even come up on the screen as we uh, talk about it. Let me know. Um, shout out to Odd. He says, uh, can't stay for the broadcast, but I want you to know that I greatly appreciate your teachings and wisdom. As a 60 year born in LA, I truly wish this info was taught 55 years ago. Appreciate that, Odd Collard. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah. Indigo, what's going on? Adrian Lavaris again, a ghetto user. What's up? Um, let's see, we got Lucid, Lucid Experience. What's up? Um, Varus asks, will you write the forward to my upcoming book called The Dust That Sat By The Door? <laughs> you, you ain't shit for that. <laughs> I got to quote BGS on that one. You ain't shit for that. Uh, <laughs> creative, what's going on? Ryan, what's up? Uh, Jail Block, what's happening? And we got Arik. I hope I pronounced that right. What's good with you, man? It's uh, Eric P. checking in from China. That's what's up. Yeah. Appreciate y'all coming through, man. This is not, we're not going to be here long. Because if you know, we did, uh, we just covered the Onyx uh, uh, media test, which we we looked at the first 11 points and um, we just added four more. So we're going to really just talk about that four, those four and kind of look at it from that vantage point. But, you know, as I say, before we get started, y'all know the deal. Like, share, subscribe, join and donate, support the channel. We can continue to bring you independent blackmail thought. So, uh, jail black, jail block asks how I'm doing. I'm good, man. Doing real good. Enjoying the Saturday. You know what I'm saying? 
Um, but I had to get this one in and talk a little bit about this because the ideas that have been added to the list, um, I've, I've tinkered with a little, but they were actually suggested by you all. And I will get into that as we go through it. Um, Tommy says, Tommy Bistro, because I might use the Onyx Media Test in a course I teach. That's what's up. And that's partly what it's designed for, right? It's designed for us to have some kind of, you know, mechanism for analyzing film in regard to black males. It's also made for filmmakers and people writing scripts to actually be able to avoid some of the pitfalls that we've grown quite accustomed to by having something they can refer to that's coming from black men, not just from, you know, some professor who's studying it, even though I'm not saying that's unimportant, but actually having black men chime in based on their own experiences with media. I think that's ex extremely useful to filmmakers who are interested in actually presenting images of black men that are not derogatory and don't come dead out of stereotype. So I think it, this serves a multiple purpose, right? It's good for filmmakers. It's good for, you know, people analyzing film, but it's also good for people who are teaching media, dealing with media. I just sent this to another professor colleague of mine and I did it on purpose so that, you know, that might be, because it's actually an activity you can use in a class, right? You can actually go through those points and, you know, uh, teach a whole lesson around it, have a whole, have all kinds of conversations. And some conversations, some of those conversations may even contradict, you know, some of the, some of the views in the piece, but it can generate thought. That's the point. Shout out to my boy, Dr. Smith. What's going on with you? His greetings here for a minute. Looking forward to the discussion. Hey, man, I appreciate that, man. Hope you're well, good brother. Thank you for that. Um, that word so anyway yeah that's that's kind of what that is so donate support the channel also make sure that um if you haven't you've already picked up the book you know what it is solutions for anti-black misandry flat blackness and black male death the black masculine's turn by uh, yours truly uh, you can pick that up on amazon you can pick it up on rutledge anywhere else you buy books um it was, it is a, it's, it's a short book, 50,000 words. That was what it was requested to be by Rutledge. It wasn't something that I decided on. That was, it. they wanted to do a short book. And the reason for that is, you know, when you deal with, you know, typical academic books, they can take years. In this instance, they wanted a book that they could put on shelves just three or four months after I submitted it to them. So that, that's kind of why it's a, a 50,000 word piece. Um, but I think it, I, I managed to put quite a bit in it that I hope will be useful to you. Uh, so please make sure you check that out and support the book if you will. All right. We got through some of the uh, house business. Uh, let me see. Uh, okay. All right. I don't know if I want to go with that piece yet, but let's go ahead and start this. Um, so as we all know, right. Um, his brother just passed away, um, just a couple of, or I think yesterday, um, you know, grew up watching his films. Uh, so that was kind of, you know, hard to kind of take, you know, I mean, you know, it's, it gets to a point where it shouldn't be surprised because these cats are, you know, some of these elders are up in age, but it still hits you nonetheless, especially if you have, you've appreciated their work over the years. And, uh, and I have, so. Uh, shout out to Lou Gossett Jr. Um, you know, I've enjoyed his film since I was young, since I was a kid. And I'll read a little bit of information about him. Uh, born Lou, uh, Louis Cameron Gossett Jr., May 27, 1936. Uh, died March 29th, 2024. American actor, born in Coney Island, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, made his stage debut at age 17. So this brother, damn, since the age of 17 has been on stage or in films, acting, doing his thing uh, for, I can't say how, I mean, that's ridiculous uh, how long this brother's been in there and he's, he's won his awards. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, he's, he's done his thing, but it's still, it's still an amazing thing to witness altogether. So I, I want to say he's been what, 61 years in the game. That's, that's virtually unheard of 61 years, roughly speaking. Um, so it says he uh, shortly after uh, 17, he uh, auditioned for the Broadway play Take a Giant Step. Gossip continued acting on stage in critically acclaimed plays, including Raisin in the Sun. He was in the 1959, I forgot about that, version of Raisin in the Sun. 
Um, you know, and his film, I mean, he's got films going back from 59 to 61, 63, 65, 77. I mean, the brother was in Roots. Uh, that's where he really, you know, um, won his outstanding lead actor for a single appearance in a drama and comedy series, uh, you know, for his Emmy, you know, uh, starring in Roots. He has done a lot since then, of course. Uh, he's known uh, for Officer and a Gentleman. He won an Academy Award. One of the things I remember, though, I remember him saying in the 80s, I believe it was, that even though he had won an Emmy and, and Academy Award, he said his phone didn't really ring. Right? He talked even then about what's supposed to happen, or at least what we know happens often for white actors. Once they win those kind of prestigious awards, their phone starts ringing. They start having roles that are catered to them rather than roles that they have to audition for. But he said those kind of things really didn't happen. And I'm paraphrasing because I wasn't planning to kind of go there. So I didn't find the clip where he talked about it. But he basically let you know folks know that that doesn't for black actors, that doesn't necessarily change the game. He still had to grind. He still had to work. Uh, roles weren't just being handed to him. But, you know, his record is all over the place. Um, you know, he, he was uh, says he won and was nominated for at other ceremonies, including the Golden Globes, Black Real Awards, NAACP Image Awards. Um, you know, he, he, the man was all over the place. The man was all over the place. I'm um, not going to spend a lot of time. Um, I just wanted to kind of tip my hat to the brother, you know, because I've grown up watching him. You know, I, I, I can't I can't ignore that because um, I didn't expect, you know, to hear that. But. Uh, I'll cover uh, two more parts of his life, though, that are fairly brief. In terms of marriages, says he was married three times, fathered one son, adopted a son. His first marriage was to Hattie Glasgow. It was annulled. His second to Christina Manga Singh, hmm, 1973. Their son Sadie was born in 74. So, yeah, you got a son my age. Gossip and Manga Singh divorced in 75. His third marriage to Star Search champion Cindy James Reese took place in 87. They adopted a son. Gossip and James Reese divorced in 92. Lewis was first cousin of actor Robert Gossett uh, from TNT's The Closer. Uh, stated in 66, uh, he was handcuffed to a tree for three hours by police in Beverly Hills. Yep. 69 was uh, partying with members of the Mamas and Papas. I don't know what that is. When they were all invited to a party at Sharon Tate's house in L.A. 69. Hmm. Gossett went home to shower, changed clothes, and was about to leave when he saw on TV news broadcast that Tate had been murdered by Charles Manson and his associates. Damn. So he was supposed to be at the house that Manson and the associates came through and murdered. Damn. That's a, that's a trip. Lastly, uh, in regard to illness and death, as he struggled with debilitating illness during the 90s and early 2000s, having been given a prognosis of six months to live from a doctor at one stage. 2001, he learned much of his illness was due to toxic mold in his Malibu home. On February 9th, 2010, Gossip announced, Gossip announced that he had prostate cancer. He added the disease was caught in its early stages and he expected to make a full recovery. In late 2020, in December, Gossip was hospitalized in Georgia uh, with, um, you know, COVID. Gossip died. He Gossip died at a rehabilitation center in Santa Monica. Uh, March 29th of this year, at the age of 87, no cause of death was given. No. So shout out to Lou Gossett Jr. Uh, for putting in work for six decades. I mean, damn. Shout out to Dub Wu. Says tuition payment. Appreciate that. Appreciate that support. Yeah. This is uh, a long life. A lot, a lot accomplished. Um, I tip my hat to the brother uh, for doing his thing. So shout out to Lou Gossett Jr. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the elements that have recently been added to the Onyx Media test. Excuse me. Um, now, how this started, because I posted it uh, on my community tab that there were some new elements added and uh, brothers added some more. Right. But how it kind of started, you all know, who watched the show. The last one we did, we covered the first 11 points of the Onyx Media test. And afterwards, I told you guys, my son and I were going to see the new Godzilla film. And we did. Um, we went and checked it out. And, um, you know, we, we had a ball. We enjoyed it. You know, it was what it was. I enjoyed Godzilla flicks. Still didn't get to see Minus One, though. So I'm going to have to catch it when it's streaming. But 
Um, and I regret that because it looked like it was uh, pretty good. I heard good reviews uh, and then it came out in black and white and I just kept, you know, putting it off. I was like, I'll get to the theater and then you know, kind of missed it. So uh, anyway, so this particular Godzilla movie, I'm watching it, you know, and in the midst of it, I keep seeing this brother who, you know, normally I find entertaining, you know, but for the most part, I mean, the brother's name is Brian Tyree Henry. I mean, we've seen him in Atlanta and uh, uh, I, I didn't watch the Eternals, but I know he was in that. And he was in a bunch of, you know, other stuff. His career's up and coming. He's been in previous Godzilla picks. Shout out to Queen Kalila. I see you. Hope you're doing well. Um, So, you know, I enjoy his work. But in this particular film, he is ridiculously afraid. I mean, a lot. He's constantly afraid. He, you know, first thing that popped into mind after a couple of minutes of watching his character was, um, you know, um, well, we'll get to that in a second. So now I'm not going to play any clips from Godzilla, you know, as far as that's concerned. But I will tell you, when you, if you go watch it, if you haven't seen it already, of course, uh, you, one of the things you'll notice is how fearful he is. And it, it really brought me back to some very old tropes that go back to the early part of the 20th century as far as media is concerned. And the, the display of black men, and they did this particularly with Asian men as well, uh, you know, being highly fearful. And the subtext to that was we were not men, right? Uh, Dr. Tommy Curry talks about the period of time where uh, black men and, and the black family really were, were considered children, were considered, uh, you know, children to white families in, in regard to how the slave structure on the plantations were set up. Black men in particular being childish and cowardly, right? And you, saw, you sort of saw that tradition and film where you had black men who were ov overly afraid, exaggeratedly so. And so this was reminiscent of that, you know, for me, uh, seeing that kind of role kind of brought back in that way. And I was just kind of, you know, kicking it around uh, and I decided to kind of do some. So I actually started writing what I was seeing while watching the film, um, which is the, the schizophrenic nature of being, you know, of analyzing, you know, film or whatnot. You find yourself just kind of split all over the place. All right. So you remember here and uh, I'll tell you what, I will put the link in the chat or Onyx Media Test. Uh, you can go to um, newblackmasculinities.wordpress.com. It is the second link. Uh, when you click on that, you go to the main page. The first thing you'll find is the black male political agenda that is pinned to the top but right underneath it you'll find the onyx media test and so when you go to that uh you'll see an image from uh, spider verse um and then from there an explanation i added a little more detail to this you know so as i said it's inspired by the feminist beckdale wallace test right uh, which was which basically measured a film for its sexism and its treatment of women um i didn't take you know points from it directly um, I just was inspired back by the fact that they did it. And I was curious if this could be applied to black men. The Onyx Media Test is a test to measure the quality of representation of black males in television, film, online, and any other narrative visual content. Such productions often mark black men as social failures due to their stereotypical behavior. Right? So a lot of what you'll see in the test, it really is uh, different representations of black male social failure. Uh, it reads, historically, black men have been shown in diminutive ways in popular media that highlight only certain aspects of the human experience. They're shown as being overly fearful, unduly self-sacrificial to their betters, even to a supernatural degree, abusive, unintelligent, weak, hypersexual, self-deprecating, unemotional, disagreeable, pandering, unnecessarily criminalistic, and only tolerable when othered. Now, understand, this is where a lot of kids growing up on media myself included, right? We tend to take in these ideas and it's not an accident that when you hear people be critical, even to a degree that's just highly misandric of black men, you hear the very stereotypes we're talking about coming out. And that happens intra-racially, meaning within the black community, you hear it. So when you hear feminists, for example, that are critical of black men, you hear all the stereotypes that, you know, I just described. Shout out to Maggie, what's going on? Hope you're well. What's up, Lewis? We got AB in the house. What's happening? You know, Mark, good to see you in here, man. Um, so anyway, um, I see Kevin. I see Ron. LXST, what's happening? 
Sorry, I overlooked some of y'all coming through. Hope everybody's well. Jerome, Dub Will, you know, number of brothers in the house. Again, donate, support the channel. If nothing else, hit the like button, please. Um, we can continue to do this. Mark says, in 22, Henry received an Oscar nomination for Best Supporting Actor in the film Causeway. Okay, thank you for that. Because I hadn't watched Causeway. I'm not familiar with that. I've seen him in a couple places. I, I haven't, you know, disliked his work. I think he's cool. I just I haven't really, you know, watched up on him. So um, maybe I'll need to. But anyway, um, going back to the Onyx Media test. So we kind of do that. And it says here, how to use the test. Answer each, qu each question about a media project of your choosing. Each answer uh, in the affirmative scores a one, while a negative answer scores a zero. The higher the score between zero and 15, the worse the, re uh, the results regarding black male representation. Right? And then it kind of goes from there where I start uh, going in detail, which is what we did in the last show. What I'm going to do is kind of skip ahead to where we find ourselves now. So we ended last time on what we called uh, the shining effect, having to do with uh, characters who were sacrificial martyrs who died for white or female characters uh, as just a plot device. They don't have any backstory. You know, there's nothing that explains why they do this. They just do it. You know, blackmail. And this goes back. I mean, you can find this going all the way back to Shirley Temple movies, right? Characters who are just overly giving, right? Uh, while at the same time, usually demonstrated as being lesser beings. Right? They're, they're less intelligent, they're less capable, they're less bright. They really have no humanistic backstory. They just exist to sacrifice for white characters. This is an old tradition, um, but I take it from, even though I love uh, Batman Crothers, you know, it, it was the role he played in The Shining that, was, that kind of brought that thought to mind. There was no disrespect intended to any of the actors that I'm identifying. I'm choosing often examples just to drive my point home so people know what I'm saying. But I mean, no disrespect, because a lot of the actors actually play a lot of different roles that are not, you know, reflective of that thing that I'm I'm, I'm talking about. But unfortunately, in certain roles, we got to call it out. So it is what it is. But the first one that has been added on to this list is um, is the cowardly lion effect. And this is what I saw with, uh, you know, Brian Tyree's Henry's performance in Godzilla. Right. Is there a character who is unduly afraid beyond other characters for no verifiable reason? Now, obviously, there's a reason as far as Godzilla, you know, there are all these monsters walking around. But here's the thing. He was more afraid of children who were in the, you know, who were with him. You know, he, there, were, there were women, there were men, there were children. He's the most fearful character about something they're all grappling with. So there's no special reason beyond what everybody's already dealing with for him to be afraid. And yet he's highly afraid on an ongoing basis because does fear govern his decision making and overall temperament obviously you can point to you know the the the, the cowardly lion from the whiz you know this one was, it was the first thing i thought of um right here when i was watching godzilla and i'm watching brian first thing i thought of was john boyega in star wars the force awakens because I hadn't seen that kind of fearfulness damn near since the 70s, at least as far as memory is concerned. It may not be realistic. That's just how it played out in my head. Um, um, Gazepo or Gadzepo probably ruined that. I apologize. Asked about Bishop of X-Men. You know, I, I can tell you, he only doesn't, he doesn't get a lot of scenes in the cartoon. I mean, there's been the new animated series. There's, I think there's only been three episodes. I will say this, the first time you see him, uh, he and Storm uh, attacking the, uh, you know, humans that are, that are terrorists. Shout out to Gregory for the cash out. Um, they both lose. You know, they both get uh, kind of knocked out, even though he doesn't have the power Storm does. Uh, he still gets kind of beaten up in his first presentation. Now, this happens before the rest of the X-Men even show up. So there's this running theme of black failure and in, in, in stereotype that we have to be cognizant of. When we look at black images, even in contemporary works, right? So Storm and Bishop are the first X-Men we see in the very first episode of this new animated uh, X-Men 97. They show up and they immediately get defeated. And then the other X-Men come in. Well, that's not to say that it's going to stay that way. Um, I didn't think there was anything particularly wrong. They cut his hair for some reason. But other than that, you know, no. But I would say just in terms of that failure it is a mark of how blackness is often presented 
in these kind of projects. And we just kind of need to be aware of that, you know? So the first two black X-Men that show up in the very first episode get, you know, kind of knocked to the side, you know, quite easily. So that being said, you know, as far as I'll go with that, uh, Kevin says, and Bishop gets less screen time in X-Men days of future path. Yeah. He's never really had a lot of screen time anyway. Um, anyway, so here we go. So yeah, seeing John Boyega as Finn, you know, be the, and this was in the very first trailer, you know, so a lot of us have been waiting for a new, you know, star Wars movie. And, you know, it, obviously many of us have been disappointed by that trilogy. But this was in the first trailer before the first movie came out in that trilogy. So we had so much hope that it was going to be good. It was going to be entertaining, so on and so forth. I was already looking at the scene like, ah, oh, shit. And I'm not saying I anticipated all the Mary Sue stuff with Ray or any of that, even though if I watched the original trailer, I probably did see elements of it. But this is what stood out to me most. So before the movie even came out, before The Force Awakens even came out, I'm looking at a level of fear in a black male character that I haven't seen. I mean, all, all he needs is for his eyes to bulge out and for him to run, you know, somewhere just in some crazy, it, it just, it really struck back to a very old tradition that I thought was highly problematic. Now, when you look at Godzilla, cause we're going to take it back to Brian, right? Um, we're going to look at, you know, who some of the people are that, that made this particular film. So if you're unfamiliar, this is Adam Wingard. Right? This is the guy who directed the latest Godzilla movie, you know, so um, kind of pointing this out. Not going to spend a lot of time here. Got to start feature filmmaking early in his uh, directorial debut with Homesick slasher horror film. You know, eh, it is what it is. But, you know, you, you check the optics. See what it is. Let's see who wrote it. And let's see. So we had Adam. No, this is one of the writers here. Got Jeremy Slater. Right. Um, he apparently wrote a fantastic, heavily panned Marvel film before being rewritten. Right. Is what it is. But, you know, you just peep the optics. That's one of the writers of Godzilla. And again, I'm looking at those who are writing the character that we see on screen in the latest Godzilla movie, uh, as far as uh, Brian Tyree Henry is concerned. Here's another one, right? You got Simon Barrett, right? Um, horror writer, day and night, uh, and a director as well as most notably known for working alongside friends and fellow film aficionados, Adam Wingard and a few other people. So I might've mis mispronounced Wingard earlier, but anyway, I'm just, you know, showing you the optics. These are the people that are writing these black characters which speaks to the need for more independent film, in my opinion, but there's a lot of brothers doing that. So it's not that it's not happening, I'm just pointing out. Uh, and this is the last writer, right? It's the last one, Terry Rosio, right? These are the people that are writing these projects, right? So we talk about this old, lead, you know, this old um, legacy of how black men have been represented, even going back to, you know, the early part of the 20th century with, um, um, goodness. And then, eh, man, I had to work on my memory for real. Anyway, just a lot of old school productions that go back to the early 20th century and onward representations of black maleness, uh, have certain tropes, you know, being irrationally violent, hypersexual, and, and, and you know, unduly fearful. Are, are three of the major tropes, I would say, uh, that, that, you know, kind of focus on that come out through stereotype of black men. So I don't think it's an accident when you start to see the faces of the people who are writing and producing and directing these kind of films that you still see these same tropes being played out. Right. Um, you see Shepard asks about Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I haven't watched it yet. I wasn't too thrilled with the movie. So, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't dislike it. It just was kind of meh. But I do know uh, Green Gorilla has been dealing with that on Patreon, if I'm not mistaken, and BGS. So you might want to check their thoughts on it. I haven't checked it. Um, I got to agree with War right here. Moses and Attack the Block is still my fave from him. It was mine, too. That's one of the reasons I was so excited to hear he was in Star Wars, because his portrayal of Moses in the film Attack the Block was the shit. Like, he was dope. I really loved that movie. Uh, and he was highly critical of his, his film, his role 
in Star Wars as well. I don't think he was oblivious to any of this. He was highly critical of it. Uh, shout out to my boy, Dr. Rasheed. What's good with you, man? Says, what you describe is what I find so unpleasant about portrayals of T'Challa in Marvel Comics. Ever since Reginald Hudlin and Christopher Priest, a series of writers have diminished the character. Real talk. Absolutely. Absolutely. Although the thing with that one, they didn't really go into fear. But one of the things they did do is they stripped him of his intelligence and gave it to his little sister, which I keep telling people is like giving Lois Lane Superman's strength and flight. You know what I mean? It's like, OK, so she's now strong and can fly and he's just running around. I mean, who, who wants to watch that Superman movie? Right? You, you know, we, we just have this thing, especially in the black community, where especially when black women are given the, the means to shape a story in regard to us, not only do they promote themselves, which is I don't have a problem with inherently, but they do it at the detriment of black men. Right. So when you look at the writing and the direction it took behind the scenes for Black Panther, they the way they call him, they nerfed him. You know, they, they really depowered him. And this was the first opportunity we got to see him on screen live action. Right. It wasn't like we saw a bunch of different movies and somebody said, well, finally, let's just do it differently. No, this was the very first time. I've been reading comics for over 40 years. This brother, he's been since the 60s, the Black Panther character. The very first time we get a live action Panther, we still don't get to see the Panther we've known in the books for decades. His greatest power has to be given to a woman. And then by the time the actor dies, shout out to Chadwick Boseman, nothing but respect. You know, uh, I, I, I respected his portrayal, even though I didn't like the way it was written. By the time he passes away and rest in power to him, they killed off his character. They gave us a little crumbs by suggesting that his son is, is they also named him T'Challa. So the idea is maybe he's the T'Challa we were supposed to see in the comic books, but are they going to really roll with two super black geniuses? Oh no. And how do they deal with a black male genius and a black female genius? I don't know if we've ever even seen that in the film, right? How, so how seriously will they take that, take him? And thank you, Mark. Yeah, I was blanking on Birth of a Nation, right? W.D.W. Griffith. Uh, Anti-Black misandry film in history. Absolutely. I appreciate that, man. Um, my brain is still on vacation, I guess. Anyway, well, that's, um, so, you know, that that's kind of what I saw so far with the Godzilla film. And it made me kind of go to creating um, or adding this new point, the Onyx Media Test. Right. So we'll go, we'll go back to that. So having to do with fear, the cowardly lion effect. You know, is there a character who's unduly afraid beyond other characters for no verifiable reason? Does fear govern his decision making and overall temperament? Y'all go watch Godzilla and you tell me what you think. Right? How many fearful black men? And it's interesting that it's, it's you know, it's, it's the Star Wars legacy and onward that we start to see the resurgence. These stereotypes don't ever really die. Sometimes they take new form. Sometimes they're merged with other stereotypes. Sometimes there are new elements that are added to old stereotypes, like things that happen in society, things that happen in media, you know, new things that the younger generations are doing. But it's interesting to see how enduring these stereotypes still are and they still come up. The difference, however, is that you'll have people who've never heard of them before, especially young folks in the black community. They'll see these images and they often don't even know to be offended. Because it doesn't, you're not aware of the legacy of that that came before it. So these these often white filmmakers will will reach back and pull some some stuff out of the past and reintroduce it to a new generation, and people just either ignore it or they just kind of don't really know what to do with it. But I'm just here to tell you that sometimes these are very old ideas that are 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 extremely, um, you know, misandric in particular to black men in ways that uh, we just need to be hip to. So this needs to be a, a multi-generational conversation so we can add context to some of the things we're seeing and hear how multiple generations uh, deal with it. Now, I wanna shout out Sweet Jones here on YouTube. If you go to the um, community tab where um, I posted on the updated media test, you'll see Sweet Jones in the comment section added two points that I really liked. I want to make sure he gets his credit for having done so. Um, uh oh, hold on. See if that works better for you guys. All right. And so he called, I, I kind of, I changed the title slightly, but he called it the Oswald Hotep Bates effect. Right. And uh, if you're not familiar, and I actually forgot the name of the character for a while. This is Oswald. Right. This is Oswald Bates from the In Living, In Living Color show. 
Um, and uh, matter of fact, I'll tell you what, why don't we watch a little of Oswald so you guys can get a sense of why Sweet Jones used him in this moment. So let me, I should have pulled it up beforehand. Um, here we go. Oh, that's weird. Damn. That is really weird. Because I know I downloaded him. He is not here. Oh, I think I know what happened. Man. Ugh. My bad. Um. Hmm. I would show it, but for some reason, whenever I play stuff out of this, the sound doesn't come through very well. But we'll give it a try. Anyway. Hmm. Let me see. Living color. I don't know if they're really doing a whole lot of copyright stuff for stuff that goes back to the 80s and early 90s, but hey, see what happens. There's one clip I was going to play that wasn't too long, but I thought it was a good explanation. Um, hmm. I guess all of them technically fit, right? All right. All right. So, all right, let me see if StreamYard will let me share it. Mm -mm -mm. And it says that. So here we go. You guys let me know. Hold on, I'll just play a clip. Tell me if you can hear it. First of all, we must. All right. So y'all let me know. Give me a one in the chat if you heard that. A one in the chat if you heard that. That little clip just a moment ago. Okay, so LXSD ST said he heard it. All right, so let me see here. Let me go ahead and expand it. Uh, we'll just listen to this minute, a little change, and hopefully YouTube won't act a fool. But here, this is Oswald Bates from In Living Color, played by Damon Wayans. And you can tell me what you uh, get out of this. Internalize the flatulation of the matter by transmitting the effervescence of the Indonesian proximity in order to further segregate the crux of my binary infection. <laughs> now, if I may retain my liquids here for one moment, I'd like to continue the redundance of my quote unquote intestinal tract See, because to preclude on the issue of world domination would only circumvent, <clears throat> excuse me, circumcise the revelation that it reflects the aphrodisiac symptoms, which now perpetrates the Jericho's activation. <laughs> so, by do not misinterpret the chauvinistic gift of the United Negro Scholarship Fund, because a mind is a terrible thing to develop without help. Allow me to expose my colon once again. The ramification inflicted on the incision placed within the fallopian cavities serves to be holistic, taken from the Latin word jalapeno. All right. Now, this is something that this is really, you know, in many ways, uh, a, a dig that's very particular to black men, right? This is not something that we've seen really directed at black women, even black children. You know, for the most part, this uh, this type of denigration is very specific in media to black men. Uh, even in black made productions, we still tend to see this. And in this instance, this is kind of um, presented in a very particular way. So I'm going to go back to what Mr. Sweet Jones contributed to the discussion, right? He says, uh, the Oswald Hotep Bates effect. Um, let me get rid of this. All right. God damn it. Just turn off. Shit. Anyway, um, is there a character whose level of black consciousness is used to ridicule black males who espouse such views as overly woke or as tinfoil koofy wearers? Here, the ridicule and vilification of black males who possess a sense of racial pride is made a pejorative joke distinct for black men in media. 
Such labeling has been used even in law enforcement against real people. Consider the case of Rakim Balaboon, the first person arrested for being considered a black identity extremist in 27, in 2017, excuse me. So if you're not familiar with that, um, I don't know if he was the only one, but I think he was. I think he was the only one that was um, arrested for being a black identity extremist. I think he was ex-military um, and you can see him here. Right. Um, so in regard to Rakim Balagoon, uh, legal name, Christopher Daniels, an American activist best known for his involvement in a Facebook related incident that occurred in December 12, 2017, which became headline headline news in the United States. It says, um, you know, from there he was arrested for that. Uh, so I will, you know, you can you can actually just go to Wikipedia and look him up or look him up on sources, other sources you may trust uh, and look into the 2017 arrest. Um, for a, being a black identity extremist, but in many ways, I think it ties to you know what we're reading about here, or you know, uh, kind of looking at here in terms of how black men are presented. And I should also say, and I might add a little more detail to this when I get to uh, get back to it. When we're talking about this Oswald Hotep Bates effect, it's not just about Hotep. It's not just about making fun of consciousness, uh, so to speak. It's actually deeper than that. It's making fun of black male intellect. It's making fun of black men who are, uh, you know, trying to espouse ideas, especially when those ideas are run counterculture or when they run, you know, against what's politically correct. It's being reframed into this, you know, kind of um, pejorative, you know, approach to looking at black male intellect. It's being dismissed, um, and you can kind of see, you know, the kind of inherent disrespect, the inher inherent lack of of uh, appreciation for black male intellect. So we're ridiculed in this way. So there's a consciousness element to it where they're making fun of people who identify with a sense of black consciousness, but there's also an element in regard to, you know, really dismissing black male intellect, you know? Um, so that's something to keep in mind. So Prince, uh, let me see, Prince Pacton, appreciate that donation, says, I found you because of O'Shea and Medium Man, and I have to say you have changed my life in ways you can't understand. I have encouraged as many black men as possible to listen. It's not much, but I wish you nothing but prosperity and good health. Appreciate that, man. Thanks. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you for that. And I didn't know medium man had said anything about me. So, you know, I like his work, you know, and shout out to O'Shea. Appreciate that word. So thanks for that, Prince. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I just want to, and I, like I said, I'll probably add another sentence to this just for that, you know, to not be dismissed and forgotten, but it's not just about consciousness. It really can relate to any display of black male intelligence that's dismissed as being less than. And again, we can see this in the larger society in regard to how men are represented, but we can also see this, uh, when it comes to black feminists and their portrayal and approach to black male intellect. I think one of the, the the most recent examples that I'm not prepared to show now, but I did watch it this morning. I think it was the mayor of New York on um, uh, with Charlemagne the God on their show, and he, you know, there was a, a it was a, an African woman who was an attorney there in New York, and you know the kind of debate that took place back and forth. Now, I have no political allegiances in New York or anything of that nature, so I'm not defending the mayor, you know, or whatnot. But you can see the kind of um, you know, hostility that I think goes beyond the political moment when it comes to black men and women having these kind of debates online. It usually in some way goes back to uh, a, a kind of acknowledging uh, black men as being less than in some way. I think a great example of that is in one of Passport OG's last videos where uh, here on YouTube, if you're not familiar, go check out the Passport OG channel. And one of his last videos, he kind of talks about or reminds us of the last presidential election cycle where black women in news media were ridiculing black men and dismissing us as Kevin Samuels, you know, kind of figures who just had no p real serious political analysis. We were just, you know, ignorant, uninformed. And I think a lot of that was coming out of the select few that were voting for Trump. So even though black men voted to the second highest degree um, just behind black women and experienced more voter disenfranchisement than any other group, Black women uh, who were active in the Democratic Party on these news media shows were making fun and dismissing black male intellect and using Kevin Samuels, uh, using a couple of other noted figures as a as a way to dismiss black male thought and analysis intelligence. It went beyond 
you know, here are the reasons you shouldn't vote for Trump. I don't even know if it ever really got there. It just went to this, you know, this kind of derogatory. This is who you guys are because you guys are willing to entertain Trump. And then a, a series of just ad hominem attacks from there. And that included Ice Cube, of course, in a very general way, um, because of, you know, his attempt, to, his plan for black America and his willingness to sit down with the right and the left. He was dismissed as a Trump supporter. But the point I'm getting at is it's not about Trump. It's not about the Democrats. It's that as long as black men don't conform to what's socially expected of us, particularly in the Democratic Party and amongst black women, we're immediately dismissed as lacking intellect. And there's a longer, deeper tradition of representing black men as unintelligent and incapable that that kind of aligns with, especially in media. And we get both. So we get this history that if you're not aware of, you know, provide some momentum to this that you don't often understand. And then, of course, you get this anti-black misandry coming from, you know, really black feminists, you know, black Democrats who are critical of black men who start to question, you know, what's going on. And I support the questioning. I support the questioning. You know, um, this is one of the reasons we have the black male political agenda, because we're saying this is the standard we're looking for. These are the, the political ideas we want to see somebody back. And if you want our votes, then you got to listen to what we're talking about and you got to be able to give us something. That's the standard where I think many black men are trying to move towards, even if they're not aware of the black male political agenda itself, but um, not just voting for who we're told to vote for. But this comes back as an attack on black male intellect. Shout out to Uru. Uh, Black Uru says uh, she was derisively blaming the New York mayor for things that occurred before he held that office. Exactly. Exactly. And I wasn't, you know, I had no plans to bring that up, so I didn't edit that. But that may, may be something we need to attack. And, and it'd be good to have you on, Black Uru, if you're interested in, in, in doing it so we could talk about that whole exchange. Because it, it went beyond the pale. There was no reason to attack the brother, you know. But at the end of the day, you know, that's, that's how Black men are often treated. So anyway. The Oswald Otep Bates effect. So you see him there um, just from the clip we watched. And then you can also see it with a character like Dave Chappelle as conspiracy, conspiracy brother, you know, from the un, uh, from undercover brother, the movie. Um, that's another kind of representation. Um, we're going to see. Yeah, I guess I'm just going to mess with YouTube all day today. So, um, so here's a clip of Conspiracy Brother, Dave Chappelle, in Undercover Brother. This is Undercover Brother. Hey, how you doing, brother? Good morning. Good morning. Get on this. Are we going to spy around me? Coach you. Spy in the building. Hot, don't touch the bro. Back up off me. Back up off me. Let me tell you something about the word good, brother. Good is an ancient Anglo-Saxon word. Go off, meaning the absence of color. I.e. it's all good, which it is, or goodwill hunting, meaning I'm hunting niggas. So if you say good morning to me, the only thing you're saying is I'm going to kill your black ass first thing in the morning. All right. So there you go. Right. Um, this is essentially what Sweet Jones is talking about with the uh, Hotep effect. He's talking about the dismissal of black intellect and its alignment with consciousness and, and that being seen as an example of black male failure. Really, that's the core of what we're talking about. Yeah, I know the, I know the volume recorded low. Um, you know, I apologize for that. But, you know, that's what we're, that's what we're talking about. Right? So these are the kinds of um, displays that we have on deck. So if you're just coming in, we're looking at the Onyx Media test. We're looking at four new points that we've added to it. Um, we talked about the cowardly lion and um, and what that meant uh, in film. And now we're looking at the Oswald Hotep Bates effect, uh, which is basically, uh, you know, kind of a making fun of black male intellect, especially black male intellect that runs counterculture or is not politically correct. And it's dismissed as unintelligent and incapable and whatnot. So that's another example coming from uh, Dave Chappelle as Conspiracy Brother. The next one up, and this is also contributed by Sweet Jones, is what I'm calling the Black Manosphere Effect. Now, it's very similar, at least in the sense that Black men are being dismissed, but this one is aimed more particularly at the Manosphere. 
and the ideas that come out of it, just like when I talked about, you know, last presidential election, you know, the women on the uh, black, the black women on the news media circuit that were dismissive of black men who were voting for Trump. And they, they, they brought in Kevin Samuels into that whole dynamic. That was a dig at the manosphere online. Right. And the idea that you have black men who are approaching things outside of what's been, um, you know, allowed for and what's expect in terms of what's expected of us and, you know, used to dig at it. So it reads, is there a character who is driven almost exclusively by nonviolent? And that's the difference, because we talked about violent uh, images of black men earlier in the Onyx Media Test. But this one is specific to nonviolent yet, quote unquote, misogynistic or homophobic views rooted and traditional male, female gender role talking points. Now, what I mean here is that it's not a matter of what's right or wrong or correct or incorrect or what, you know, it, 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 that's all left to what people believe. But in terms of what's considered popular culture, in terms of mainstream culture, what they consider to be misogynistic or homophobic, which in many respects is often used to dismiss uh, particularly heterosexual black male thought without having to grapple with the ideas that are posed. They're just dismissed as as misogynistic so that you don't actually have to have a conversation about what black men are thinking about. But yet and still are these kind of terms being attributed or, you know, at least some generic ideas about them being attributed to black men in a media project. Right. The talking points are usually not empirically based. Uh, they're often inaccurate, are maliciously attributed to black males who identify with red pill philosophy and are played for laughs due to the stupidity. Uh, of the character via his awkwardness with women. In other words, if he says something that mainstream, the mainstream female audience doesn't like, and he's automatically dismissed as misogynistic and because the talking points are, are attributed to red pill spaces, but aren't actually quoted from those spaces. It's just, you know, ad hominem attacks veiled through um, straw man arguments, really. They're, they're fabricating red pill arguments just to make fun of them and at the same time dig at the manosphere. Do you have that happening? Now, I'm not talking about the manosphere uh, directly in the sense that it has to just come from, you know, contemporary sources. Anything that's deemed along those lines, even th things that existed decades before the manosphere in its most formal uh, form. This is one of the reasons that you'll see here um, Adolf Caesar as old Mr. Johnson. And I'm going to explain that to you by showing you this clip. Um, what I mean. Right. So this is the kind of thing in the modern day moment would be used to directly dig at the manosphere, but it's still indirect and it still attacks black men that have more traditional beliefs. Um, so let me see. Here's an example of old Mr. Played by Adolf Caesar, who, by the way, Louis Gossett Jr. Played in the, the recent color purple, but you know, all due respect to uh, Louis Gossett Jr. You can't follow up Adolf Caesar. Adolf Caesar steals any movie he's in. And the most two notable, the notable films we know of are, are Soldier Story and uh, Color, The Color Purple. I'm not a fan of The Color Purple, but if you do watch it, Adolf Caesar will have you on your ass. But here's a clip of what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know the way he talks, just crazy. I hear she got that nasty women's disease. Legs like baseball bat. I mean, this but essentially, and I'm going to let the scene continue. What, what we have here is a father talking to his son about marriage, about women. And what he's basically trying to tell him is you need to get married. You need a traditional woman. You need this and that. And he's criticizing his son's choices in that. But what's reminiscent of the Manosphere, even though this is decades prior, is this push for traditional family, this push for uh, male, fem female gender dynamics that are more traditional. Uh, you still hear that. And yet, the character itself was written to ridicule men that had traditionalist beliefs. So even in the early 80s, we saw the same pattern that we're starting to see a resurgence of as it's critical of the manosphere. But it's really critical of black men with traditionalist views. And it's dismissive because they use the most extreme and misogynistic statements and use that to malign an entire group of men, many of whom have nothing to do with misogyny or anything of that nature. But it's successful in many respects because now people don't have to hear what you're saying simply because you can be dismissed for these types of extremist examples. So it's kind of a straw man argument, but here, here's the, la la the latter half. So Adolf Caesar, I'm, it, it, you know, the funniest thing with him is even women, and I know women to this day that hated Danny Glover for his portrayal of, they don't, e they don't even separate Mr. from Danny Glover. They actually hate Danny Glover because of how well he played Mr. 
in the movie, I remember still hearing even those women laughing whenever Adolf Caesar spoke. So, so Adolf was talented. Adolf was crazy talented. And um, and he's long since passed. And I never thought he got his due, even in the black community, for his talent. You know, and again, if you haven't seen him, you can check the color purple. But I really hi- highly recommend a soldier story because you get to see more of him. And he's acting comedy drama. The man was a genius in terms of his comedic timing, his, you know, his approach to it, his intensity, you know, uh, and the characters weren't the same. So he wasn't, you know, pigeonholed into one kind of role. This this character was very different from Sarge in a soldier story, but equally brilliant. But I'm sorry. Every time I hear him in this movie, he makes me laugh. He, I hear she got that nasty woman's disease. <laughs> like, what are you? What is it? <laughs> he was hilarious. I'm sorry. But anyway, yeah. So that's an example of what we're talking about as well. When you see, uh, let me pull it back up here. The kind of use of this kind of, uh, in its latest form, this black manosphere idea to really deny and downplay, um, you know, traditional black men as being nothing more than sexist. And again, because you don't actually have to quote from anybody, especially Kevin Samuels, you don't actually have to quote him and then respond to something he said. You get to create the statement that is the most extreme sexist statement you can find, attribute it to a whole mass of men and then dismiss it and walk away, leading others to do the same. And again, not allowing people the opportunity to actually hear the argument, right? And I think a lot of people did that with Kevin after he passed. A lot of people. They dismissed what he had to say. And um, and we found that happening to the entire space as a whole. So, you know, it's one of those kind of things that we don't forget. uh, We pay attention to. And I want to call out just to make sure so that nobody um, can just walk away and get rid of this without having to hear what we're actually saying. This is one of the reasons I want to document the things we're saying and provide the data behind it. Otherwise, we just continue to see you know black men being denied their actual thought process, you know, the actual idea. Last one, um, I'm not a racist. And this is contributed by Inca- Guy Incognito from the same community tab you can find here on YouTube here on my, on my channel. And he contributed this idea. Right? says, is there a character whose only purpose is to ensure that his white friend or companion is not racist? He has little substance and virtually no background story. And you notice that's one of the most consistent tropes with all black male characters. We are, you know, sidekicks. That's really what black men have been. That's the legacy of black men. If you leave it to white Hollywood, we are sidekicks that have no backstory, that have no history, that have no self-identification. We are there um, in the back, in the background to provide service to white or female characters and and really to highlight their brilliance, highlight their greatness, their intelligence, whatever it is, strength, sexiness, you name it. We are the backdrop. So whether we're beat up to show how strong they are, whether we're outsmarted to show how smart they are. And in this instance, we're just present as, you know, non-threatening black friends to point out how, you know, how cool a guy is, right? A, A female character, a white character, a female character. That's what you have here, right? So he has little substance, virtually no background story. He's usually the only black character in the film, right? And the example I chose from this is Dave Chappelle as Kevin Jackson in You've Got Mail, right? 1998 film with Tom Hanks, um, where you actually get to see uh, Dave playing this the non-threatening black uh, friend. That's essentially what he is. Um, yeah, Passport OG is right. Future from 8 Mile. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Because all the shit that, you know, uh, uh, somebody like Eminem's character would actually say in real life going through that. (laughs) He diffuses that by advocating for that character. So you're absolutely right. Um, Let me see. I think I have a a clip. It's a clip from the film. Um, Oh, you got mail. Eh, I mean, I won't get into the convoluted story. You know, two white characters falling in love uh, while negotiating X technology and kind of, you know, that whole kind of thing. So this is really, you know, this is even before texting as far as smart, this is before smartphones. This is just when you were texting on your computer and you had to open, you know, open up, get online with a modem. So this is the late nineties. And so you have two people that really don't like each other that are, that don't realize they're falling in love through text. And Dave plays the best friend to Tom Hanks, 
So kind of let's see what he says here. All right. Well, that's all I'll play for you. But you get the idea, right? He's he's the he's feckless. He's 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 non-threatening. He's just a cool guy. But really, he's not there for his own purposes. He's only there to highlight Tom Hanks's character so that you know that Tom Hanks is not only a nice guy, but he's he's not racist. You know, and, and I've often, you know, especially now, a lot of these kind of roles are uh, DEI based, you know, to diversify a story. But again, the way it's usually set up, you know, this affable guy would not be hanging with Kevin Johnson, Dave Chappelle's character, unless he wasn't racist. And, and you kind of have that legacy. So um, Black Uru again says Will Smith was the biggest star in Hollywood and they turned him into Matt Damon's magical Negro caddy and bagger bands. Absolutely. And we have a magical Negro category already in the Onyx Media Test. So this one is a slight difference. This one kind of goes more to the side. Uh, yeah. Excellent examples. Chris Rock and Grown Ups. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Danny Glover and Lethal Weapon. You see, you see the interesting thing about it. Um, somebody says uh, low key, the magical Negro trope. It, acts, it is, but it just doesn't involve any supernatural elements. And, you know, the, the characters don't really have to do anything, but just, you know, make somebody else look cool. And that's the point. Right. But notice how when we put these examples out, how many people can resonate with them and start giving you examples, because these aren't just, you know, one time things that pop up. These are longstanding tropes that we've just learned. I mean, when I teach media, one of the things I, I point out to people is this is, you know, Americana. This is this is the the the, the visual vocabulary uh, as far as black men are concerned in American media. And you have to learn this visual vo vocabulary to understand how black men are perceived and thought about and treated. And it kind of situates you. So if you come from another country, especially if you don't speak English and you're unfamiliar with American film or media, one of the things you have to learn first is the vocabulary. Obviously, the language is important, but you can still pick up ideas even if you don't speak English. And if you get the video uh, or the, the visual vocabulary in place as far as race and gender is concerned, the image of black men, there are specific tropes that you pick up on quickly. And they're designed to you know teach people how to treat and perceive black men. And really in regard to the black community, they're designed to show us what's acceptable um, from us, what others will accept from us. And of course, what others won't, depending on the stereotype. Well, these images are are really framed around um, our lack of humanity and and really uh, consistent ideas about social fa uh, failure. You're not often the leader. You're not also often in a position where you're articulating truth. You know, you're you're just kind of in the background or you play a role to make others look a certain way. Um, let's see. I don't know what that's. I'm trying to read. I don't know what that's referring to. Oh, okay. You're talking about the uh, Eric Adams video. Okay. This is from the collector. I'm not saying he needed to be checked. He, di he didn't need to be checked. I don't have any allegiance to Eric Adams. What I'm talking about is the hostility. And what I was talking about is the, the kind of attack on black maleness, because you can see the same thing in other clips earlier on, especially around the last presidential election uh, in terms of how black men are portrayed. I am never going to argue that we are incapable or above being checked or critiqued. It's not my argument at all. I'm saying it's about how it's done. And if it's done in a manner that highlights this kind of tradition of perceiving black men as being less uh, capable, which I think there's a longstanding tradition of even within the black community, that's what I'm calling out. I have no problem with Eric Adams being checked. I have no political allegiance to him. I don't even live in New York. I was born there, but I don't live there. So I'm not above the critique. I'm just saying the way the hostility and the misandry part of it is what you got to call out when you see it. And is that necessary to check black men? And you actually have an argument. It doesn't have to get personal or doesn't have to deride him in some misandric fashion to make your point. Um, let's see. Lauren says uh, Michael Clark Duncan in Green Mile was the ultimate magical Negro. Yep. Showed him in the image. If you go to the Onyx Media Test, you can see him there right alongside Bagger Vance in terms of uh, the magical Negro. Um, Guru says, uh, yeah, same thing, right? Um, yeah. So you guys missed the last show where I went into more detail about that. Um, Kevin says, Griff, I'm married with children. Damn. <laughs> he pulled, you went deep. <laughs> Found that. <laughs> Shout out to chaos reigns. What's good, man. Um, yeah, well, here we go. Dwight nails it. it says goes back to the menstrual era, 18, 1829 to modernity. Absolutely. 
right? Absolutely. So these, again, we're really just calling out new forms of old ideas. It's essentially what this media test does. Uh, it's calling out, you know, contemporary, uh, the contemporary reframing of old ideas about black men. And so if you're unfamiliar and I'll put the link back in, in the chat, um, let's pull it on screen. It's last time because some of you sound like, you know, you're, you're hearing the second show. This is part two, but you missed part one. So a lot of the things you're talking about, uh, we've covered in part one and it's not a long read. It's, it's just the blog. I try to keep my blogs relatively short these days, just so that, um, you can peruse through it pretty quickly. So there's 15 points on it that highlight that basically ask questions about how black men are represented and, you know, and, and again, measure a film's, um, use of the black male image and really provides us some type of scale to, um, you know, you know, kind of get at whether or not a, a media project is, is representing black men well, or regurgitating very old problematic ideas. So there's actually a scoring mechanism that goes with this that you can pose to any media project you're looking at. It's also something that can be used in the classroom. Um, so if you're a teacher, a professor or any of that, and you're dealing with media, if you want to, because, you know, we can talk about black men, but I think the only place you really hear about it is in works that are specifically about stereotypes, which is great. But, you know, a lot of them are rooted in, you know, uh, just kind of an, an older approach. And I wanted to kind of use some contemporary examples to make it a little more accessible to students today. So if you're interested in media and dealing with black men, this might be something you can use in a classroom. And again, it's also posed to filmmakers who are um, interested in using the black male image. Uh, if, whether you're writing scripts or you're making films, this might be a good rule of thumb to operate by to make sure you're not regurgitating you know, problematic ideas about black men, very misandric, uh, dehumanizing ideas rooted in uh, really various types of social failure. You know, this is a way to make sure that you're not falling into that. And it's easy to do because we've all grown up with this. So, you know, again, asking a fish to describe water is how it can be when it comes to representing black men, because we're used to a certain vocabulary, a video of the visual vocabulary. We're used to certain ideas that we often don't know how to excavate and analyze because there's so much a part of how we've been taught to see ourselves and how others have been taught to see us as well. So this is just something I kind of wanted to throw out there. And I wanted to let you guys know about part two. Um, I'm always open to, you know, any additions because this is really about, you know, us being able to correct our own ethnic image. Okay. So I'm hoping more than anything that the way we teach media analysis and the way we actually participate in it can grow more and more refined and we can start to call out shit that has been highly problematic about us from day one. So again, just kind of perusing through it, some instructions on how to use this, this, uh, this thing, uh, some descriptions of the various types of, uh, problematic, uh, roles that we've seen over the years playing into this. And then, um, you know, kind of giving you an, a, a chance to kind of assess what we've seen. And sometimes this is good to look at because you can enjoy this is what's so uh, schizophrenic about doing media analysis. You can find yourself enjoying these things and yet being critical of them at the same time. And until you get used to it, it feels schizophrenic. Like I can I can you know, I, I grew up as a latchkey kid. All we did was watch TV. Right. And so doing that, I can't tell you how many films and projects and television shows and and even online content that I saw that was. I didn't have a word for it until I watched uh, Melvin Van Peebles. He did a documentary called Classified X, where he analyzed and, and you know, uh, really provided an assessment of how black men were represented, how black people were represented in film. His wasn't limited to black men. But he said the very first time he, he saw something in a movie theater that had to do with black folk, he didn't know how to describe how he felt till much later. And he said what he felt was shame. Right. So here you are happy to see your image on the screen for the first time in his era. And yet at the same time, despite how proud you were to see your image on the screen, there was something wrong with it that we didn't have the vocabulary to, you know, kind of break down at the time. And I think that still occurs to this day. 
Oh, I can be sitting in a film and feel entirely split. I can literally hate how we're represented and enjoy the film at the same time. And it took me a long time to come to grips with that because it was like, well, if I'm enjoying it, you know, I'm clearly contributing to it. But then when you get the capacity to criticize it and speak about it clearly enough to give people a vocabulary to use to help analyze things, you're actually helping. So it, 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 it can be a bit split, but it doesn't mean that it isn't necessary for us to engage. Right. Uh, what's up, Officer Faulkner? Good to see you in here. Yeah, brother Chris, uh, classified X. You might even be able to find it on YouTube, um, but it's a it's a really short, you know, kind of documentary where Melvin is kind of, and he shows you a lot of examples from films from like the '40s through the '70s. Uh, I think it ends kind of the '80s. It's an older piece. It's not new. Uh, and shout out to Melvin who passed away um, fairly recently. We we acknowledged him when he passed, but um, yeah, he talks about filmmaking, black filmmaking, early on. Uh, I want to say back to Birth of a Nation, at least through the 70s. And he shows you the problematic roles um, and characters that black men and women uh, grappled with and what that how that contributed to our sense of the public, you know, of, of our ethnic image, so on and so forth. Check that out. Classified X. You can also check out the film Ethnic Notions. Um, uh, somebody brought it up in the chat a little bit earlier. Ethnic Notions is a critical piece in black media analysis that, you know, you know, people still show to this day, and it, it was a short documentary made back in the 80s as well. Um, and the brother's name who made it escapes me, despite how many years I've been showing that film, and I do apologize. Um, let me see, but it, it's it's necessary. So I would check that out. And I think, again, you might be able to find that too on YouTube. I've had it for so long, I've never looked for it. Um, let me see, Paul, at, oh, there we go. Paul asks, are you familiar with Carlton Moss? Rest in peace. He taught a class at UC Irvine called The Image of the Black Man in Film. No, I don't think I've ever met him. Um, but if you have some information on him, send him to me. Um, let's see. Okay, so Charles says birthday weekend, April 1st. <laughs> All right, brother. Happy birthday to Officer Faulkner. Hope you're well, good brother. Owner of uh, Black Lion Security. So shout out to the brother. You know, happy birthday. Um, yeah, so a lot of these kind of tropes, we got to call out, we got to call them out. That's what the intent is behind this. So there it is. Hope you guys are well, hope you guys appreciate it. I want to hear your thoughts. I want to hear your ideas. If we got something wrong or we missed something, or you have a new idea altogether, feel free to contribute it. Um, and we'll go from there. Um, and if you can, if you can think of examples, it makes it even easier, right? Because I think when you provide examples, you know, it, People can resonate more readily uh, and get what you mean. But I'm still tinkering with this. So there'll be some, you know, slight additions, slight edits here and there um, as we go. So those of you who are using it in classrooms, you know, feel free to let me know what the feedback is, what, what happens in the discussions. Thank you, Dwight. I think you were the one that brought up uh, ethnic notions earlier. Marlon Riggs. Marlon Riggs. Um, you know, gay brother, media and analyst. Um, he did a couple of documentaries, one called Color Adjustment, that I think was really good as well. And it talks about, you know, color in the black community. And he goes into some interesting breakdowns. I, you know, you don't often get to see people still doing this kind of work now. It, you know, why not even make it to, you know, to, to be put out? But nevertheless, there's some interesting elements to it. So check out Color Adjustment, check out Ethnic Notions, see if you can find them on YouTube or on any other website. Uh, excellent films, even though they're older, they still, they're still relevant, in my humble opinion. The thing with stereotypes, though, he lays out the major stereotypes, which is important. But you also have variations and mixtures of various stereotypes that come out after. So it's something to keep up with. So check that out. Yeah, it's on California Newsreels. That's the production, I think, production company that put out Ethnic Notions. So anyway, yeah, man, just wanted to kind of get y'all that and, and get your thoughts. So, um, uh, yeah, I am familiar with Earl Afari Hutchinson. I never met him, but I am familiar with his book, The Assassination of the Black Male Image, circa 1995. Absolutely. Absolutely. So check that out and we'll go from there. So, and I think we're covering things that aren't covered in, in previous media projects. So we're contributing to, you know, some things that, um, you know, are happening now that you don't get to hear of in the same kind of way. And it's not politically correct. So, you know, it's not a guarantee that even your favorite 
you know, online content creators will even address it in this way. So again, check it out. Give your thoughts. Appreciate you guys being here. Hope you have a good weekend. Peace.